Everybody loves superheroes. Doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, if you're male or female, young or mature, whatever. We love the idea that a seemingly ordinary individual can possess superhuman powers or technology to help them solve crimes, save people in distress, thwart supervillains. Perhaps it's the origin stories that we most relate to. The notion that adversity is an amazing and wonderful thing that we should all embrace. Perhaps it's our desire to live in a better world. Perhaps it's the idea that we can be more than what we are. The idea that we can be flawed, but still super. The word superhero was first introduced sometime around 1917. Born from the archetypes of mythological gods, folklore heroes, and even vigilantes of the Old West. But the late 1930s and 1940s saw the explosion of the superhero genre. And it certainly didn't stop there. But with all of the special effects, the ever-progressing characters and their technology, the movie magic, at the root of everything, superheroes also live mundane, normal lives. And that's pretty incredible. Incredibles films were directed by Brad Bird, with production designers Lou Romano for The Incredibles 1 and Ralph Eggleston for Incredibles 2. Eggleston was also the art director for the first film. We'd love to credit the entire team of these amazing films, but we'll leave that to the credits of the actual movies, which are such fun to watch. So where to begin? I guess... at the beginning. It is the year 1947. Metroville is played by villains who try to constantly undermine the authority. Who can we turn to? Meet Mr. Incredible, the larger-than-life man with the muscle. Meet Elastigirl, the incredible, stretchable wonder vixen. And who can forget Frozone, the coolest lady man out of town. But who are they really? Every superhero has a secret identity. I don't know a single one who doesn't. With an animated film, anything is possible. And at the root of everything that we love about these movies is always the design of the characters. Unlike some animations that give life to animals, inanimate objects, etc., The Incredibles movies are human stories. In fact, they're the first Pixar human stories. While we can extract realism, there is certainly intentional exaggeration to showcase the uniqueness and individuality of each character, even using their forms to showcase their abilities. For example, Mr. Incredible is the epitome of sheer strength and power with the broad shoulders, square jawline, typical V-body. That's when he's happy and able to be himself, that is. When he's working for InsuraCare, he's overweight, he slouches, he's been beaten down by a soulless corporate existence. Mrs. Incredible, or Elastigirl, has an exaggerated hourglass figure, which celebrates her life as a mother and her powerful femininity. Her long limbs indicate stretchiness with a round, wholesome face. Then there are the kids, who definitely take after their parents. Violet has a very thin hourglass figure, her overall posture and outward self-confidence change her a bit over time. Before she was allowed to embrace her superpowers, she stayed hidden, hair in her face, using her invisibility to hide from the world. But that changes with confidence, and we see the shift before our eyes. Dash has a similar body type to his dad's, but a bit beefier, with short legs and swept back hair, indicative of the speed at which he can move. Jack-Jack, the baby, who has 17 different superpowers, Spontaneous combustion, multiplication, ability to turn into a heavy metal, demon baby, ability to turn into a blob, interdimensional travel, laser eyes, floating, teleportation, growth, the ability to move through solid objects, telekinesis, shape-shifting, propulsion sneezes, electricity emission. Because he's got so many abilities, he just resembles a typical baby, but possibly the cutest baby ever. <laughs> Syndrome is loosely modeled after director Brad Bird, at least facially speaking, but there's nothing special about the character otherwise. He's not particularly fit or tall, or has any obvious traits that would make him stand out. And we can say the same for Evelyn Deaver. And that's why these supervillains don't have any powers. They're mundane, but highly intelligent, and are thus able to create their own superpowers. There are so many characters to talk about, we can't possibly cover them all. But we have to talk about our personal favorite, Edna Mode. I'm sure most of you know that after consulting with several actresses to voice the character, Brad Bird ended up doing it himself. And he did it flawlessly. Virtually indestructible. Let it breathe like Egyptian cotton. Edna's look is inspired by Edith Head, a brilliant costume designer who holds the record of winning eight Academy Awards for her work and designed costumes for an astounding 445 films. 
you'd recognize her work from some of them. She's the perfect inspiration for a fashion designer for the era in which the film takes place. Fast forward 15 years from the beginning newsreels. It's 1962. Supers using their powers has been outlawed. They've all been relocated and their identities concealed in an effort to hide them from the world. It is time for their secret identity to become their only identity. It's mid-century, a time of optimism, of looking toward the future, of embracing new ideas and even a new model of living. The production team for the film used the term retrofuturism. It's even celebrated in the Disney logo in the end credits of both of the films. A nod not only to Bird's original vision of a cell animated and not a computer generated film, but also clearly inspired by graphic designer Saul Bass, also a filmmaker who worked on numerous award winning title sequences, corporate logos, and even film posters. It's a world that's embraced the Villa Radius, or Radiant City, with a downtown urban center and Miesian buildings, in this case, Municipurg surrounded by lower rise, more industrial factory buildings, and then sprawling out to the suburbs, which became possible post-war due to the more intense reliance on and reverence for the motor vehicle. The suburbs scream googie. The term googie architecture, which later became known as mid-century modern, first appeared in a February 1952 issue of the now defunct The Magazine of Building House and Home. In his article entitled Googie Architecture, Editor Douglas Haskell quotes a fictional Professor Thrub to explain they, meaning architects, have brought modern architecture down from the mountain and set ordinary clients, ordinary people free. Okay, but what is it? Just like the optimistic forward-looking tone of society in general, Googie architecture is futuristic. It's influenced by the space age, the atomic age, car culture, jets, things of that nature. The name comes from a coffee shop called Googie's. Sadly torn down, it was located in Hollywood and was designed by famed mid-century architect John Lautner. But back to the Parr family house, which is basically a poster house for the time period with its color scheme, decor, wood built-ins, angular kitchen with futuristic countertop oven. But the films aren't limited to just this style. You'll see a lot of influences of that era, as well as the preceding and following, or even later eras. There's the very apparent reference to the Safari Inn in Burbank, which is not far from Walt Disney Studios. There's the Happy Platter, which reminds us of norms. Edna's house reminds us a lot of a grand version of De Stiel. The house that Winston Deaver lets the Pars stay in in the second film is absolutely inspired by the Sheets Goldstein residence in LA, also designed by John Lautner. But for the design of that house, they've definitely thrown in a few nods to other superheroes and the notion of futuristic spy films with use of gadgets, remotes, and even secret entrances. We used the term Miesian earlier. That refers to the very ordered but beautiful architecture of Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. The Incredibles too has a setting that's evocative of 1960s New York City, which they call New Urban. We mentioned the Radiant City, this was an unrealized project by famous architect Le Corbusier in 1930 that became the basis of much of the urban planning of the 1930s and 1940s. There's a very contemporary look to many of the locations in the second film, but it's constantly nodding back to the 1960s, and even before, to optimism and grandeur. And then of course, there are the villains' lairs. Well, lair, since Evelyn Deaver doesn't seem to have a dedicated hideout. In the first movie, however, Syndrome has a whole island, cleverly called No Man is an Island, which definitely took an aesthetic nod from Neverland, as well as embracing James Bond, a real spy film influence. There's even a version of a Bond girl. We also spied a little bit of a nod to one of our favorite superhero movies. The room where Bob is sifting through superhero files reminds us a lot of Cerebro from X-Men. But while being very technologically advanced and forward thinking, it also embraces the era. It was very clearly inspired by Charles Deaton's sculptured house from 1963. You might recognize it from the Woody Allen movie, Sleeper. The design of Syndrome's hideout, vehicles, and even weapons have a more sleek futuristic look inspired by a lot of forms of other designs and films of that era, which contrasts a lot with the more angular aesthetic that tends to surround the part, further juxtaposing the notion of hero versus villain. Another 
way this is done is through the use of color and light. But the colors used throughout the movie aren't just indicative of good versus evil. They help to create a visual language of mood. For example, you'll notice how drab and monochromatic the scenes in Bob's workplaces are, with its endless sea of inconspicuous cubicles. The light is very cold because it's not a healthy or a happy environment. That changes to a little bit more color introduced when he arrives home and is surrounded by his family, and the light becomes a little more warm and welcoming, marking comfort and safety. During sequences when Bob, or even the whole family, get to use and celebrate their amazing powers, the colors are significantly changed to a very bright and bold palette, and the lighting even gets brighter. Shadows become more extreme. You'll notice this is taken down by a more blue tone whenever they find themselves in a situation of hopelessness. Whether it's being captured by Syndrome or Evelyn, the light is a lot dimmer in these scenes, with more localized light sources, usually a byproduct of the technology that the villains are using. Between both films, there's a gap of 14 years. In the world of tech, particularly at the pace in which we're progressing, that's an ocean of technological innovation. And you can see it between the films. There's more detail in the backgrounds. There's more variation in crowd characters. Where the first film used an everyman and modified him for various characters, you'll see a lot more differentiation in the second one. But besides these advances and the huge span of time between them, the films are seamless. They don't feel different from one another at all. The Incredibles universe is a flawlessly immersive throwback that captivates and transports us to a time when we had nothing but the future ahead of us. Something that we've not lost, but that gets buried and forgotten in our everyday lives. What we have to remember about ourselves is the same as the reason we adore these movies. We're all special in our own unique ways, and thus, at the end of the day, we're all supers. Thanks for watching. Is there anything you'd like to add? Any films you'd like for us to cover? Leave a comment down below. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out our others. Give us a like, a subscribe, and follow us in a structure on social media.